This lecture analyzes Macbeth's Tomorrow and Tomorrow speech from the end of one of Shakespeare's major tragedies. There are three parts to this video. First, a performance and discussion by Sir Ian McKellen, then a short performance and conversation about it by Sir Patrick Stewart, followed by a group conversation with Ed Evans, Professor William Colbrenner, and myself. What is it, you suppose, which connects Richard Burbage, David Garrick, Donald Wolford, John Gilgood, and uh, other actors like me who managed to earn a living by acting in Shakespeare's plays? I think it's an undying affection and belief that Shakespeare, more than any other writer who ever lived, understood the complexities of human life, the variety of human beings, and the subtleties that go to make up our existence and for me those complexities cannot be uh, expressed by the actor unless he has fully understood them uh, in the verse in which they are expressed on the page and I thought I'd like to let you into a few of the secrets which I unlocked when I was preparing Macbeth and I want to take a, a speech which is now famous um, but let me first read it in perhaps the accent it was first pronounced for the very first audience who ever heard it in Elizabethan England. Accents like clothes have fashions and sounds change. It may have sounded something like this. She should have died hereafter. Thou would have been a tomb for such a ward. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pierce from dear to dear to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Oot, oot, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his oar upon the stage, and then is hard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of soon and fury, signifying nothing. But we can't... Oh, please. Each speech must be put in the context not only of the scene but in the context of the whole play so young Macbeth arrives back uh, from battle having single-handedly almost saved Scotland from defeat and like many another successful general wants to go into professional politics uh, he meets three witches who promise him that he can be king of Scotland if only uh, he will kill, kill the present king Duncan the good old man his patron and friend, and urged on by his wife, he commits the murder, and then there starts the reign of terror, which sends good men into exile, and at this point, at the end of the play, the good men are returning with troops to surround Macbeth, besieged in his castle where he is bereft of friends and troops, and at this point, uh, a lone supporter arrives to give him the news that the queen, my lord, is dead. And the simplicity of those monosyllables is carried on in the speech which follows. There is not, I think, in this speech uh, a single word that a child of five, knowing English, couldn't understand. Macbeth says she should have died hereafter. She had to die sometime. And at that point, in the little theatre where we first did Macbeth, the other actor would leave the stage, leaving the bare wooden platform such as this, for me to communicate directly with the audience who were around it as you are now. And I fixed someone in the audience with my eye and said, there would have been a time for such a word. There would have been a time. The whole speech is about time, Macbeth's position in time, and indeed our position too. There would have been a time for such a word. What word? Is that word searching back to the queen, dead, died hereafter? No, I think it's leading on with the tripping of the rhythm of the line. There would have been a time for such a word like the ticking of a clock, leads on to the next word, which is tomorrow. And immediately the vowels lengthen and the rhythm slows up. And tomorrow, as the repetition of the future, as a bleak desert of repetitions. And tomorrow. You know, if you say a word often enough, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. What does the word mean, tomorrow, tomorrow? It has no meaning, as life is beginning to lose its meaning for Macbeth. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day.
today, today, we've had tomorrow, we've got today, two elements of time. And here's the first image, the first metaphor of the speech creeps in this petty pace from day to day. That's how the future is proceeding as far as Macbeth can see. It's the picture here, what, of someone creeping, not with a grandiloquent stride, but a little petty pace along an Elizabethan street. There's something mean about it, uh, as there is something mean about life for Macbeth. How long does this go on? It goes on to the last syllable of recorded time. That's how far the tomorrows are going to stretch. Not to the last word, but to the last syllable of the last word, when the big, big bang comes and the world ends and all the clocks stop and time is no longer recorded. What records time? Clocks and bells, syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays, we've had tomorrow, we've had today, we've now got yesterday, it's the full complex of time. And Macbeth is in that time not only he is, but we are, all our yesterdays. You're beginning to be drawn into Macbeth's predicament. He's willing you into it by referring to you. And what have all our collective experience done? What's the whole of human experience been about? It has lighted fools the way to dusty death. That's what all of our common experience has been about. Holding up a light, a lantern, a candle, to light fools who are going along with petty pace, village idiots, those sort of fools, who tumble into the dust of the unmade road of Elizabethan England. Fool, of course, has another meaning, uh, professional entertainer, festi, uh, King Lear's fool. Uh, professional stage will be important in a minute, I think, in the speech. Out, out, brief candle. Try and put a candle out. 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 You have to do it twice, don't you? Brief candle. Life isn't some wonderful Roman candle. It's not something casting incandescence throughout the universe. It's a brief candle. It's a penny candle. It's the thing you keep in the kitchen drawer for emergencies. The cheapest thing in your house. Macbeth is saying, that's what life is like. And that candle has even gone out. Life he says, is but a walking shadow. It's not even the candle. It's not even, it has no substance. It's a shadow. There's a phrase in the theatre, walking gentleman. He's the meanest member of any company. Uh, he plays any old part and gets paid the least amount of money. Life isn't even a walking gentleman. He's a walking shadow. And yes, Macbeth is thinking of actors because his next phrase is a poor player. Life is a poor player that struts, and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. What life is like? An actor, says Macbeth, being played by McKellen, who is an actor. Life is like me, that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, which is what I've been doing all evening during acting Shakespeare, and then is heard no more when I go behind the cur curtain and am never seen again. I vanish from your sight. I've been strutting and fretting, what a way to earn a living, Macbeth is saying. How despicable acting is. And Mac McKellen, who's an actor, is saying that even as he is Macbeth. And if Macbeth thinks that McKellen is wasting his time being an actor, what the hell do you think you're doing watching me? <laughs> <laughs> and it's that way, it's in that way that Shakespeare and Macbeth bring you in to the present tense. And don't allow you to think of Macbeth as just a fairy story something that doesn't really belong to you because it is McKellen's predicament and therefore yours because we are bound together, audience and actor, on a stage. Life is a tale, a fairy tale, Arabian Nights tale. No. It's a tale told by an idiot. Tomorrow and tomorrow. And tomorrow, says the village idiot, going along the little country lane with petty pain. Tomorrow, and, uh, tomorrow, and, uh, tomorrow, full of sound and fury, signifying the blackest, blankest wor word in the English language, conveying the total emptiness of Macbeth's vision and Macbeth's future and Macbeth's hope nothing. There is 
no more pessimistic view of human life than Macbeth has reached at that point in the play. And me playing Macbeth, it's not enough for me to come out with some generalised despair. It must be as particular as that analysis which I've just given you. Not so that I can give a university lecture when I'm acting the part, but so that during rehearsal and in the performance, containing all those ideas in my head, I can filter them through the rest of uh, an actor's accoutrements, my uh, hands, my arms, my legs, my body, my face my voice, uh, and like a pianist who appears not only to be putting the music into the piano, but also taking it out, I am not only Macbeth, I am in a sense the man who wrote Macbeth, and it's my privilege in acting Shakespeare for occasionally to understand what it's like to have been Shakespeare. And now Or was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour up on the stage. And then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot. Full of sound and fury. Signifying... Nothing. So if we take a, a speech like uh, Macbeth's last soliloquy, uh, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, which, uh, to crudely summarise, is, is, a, is a description of total blackness, total despair, uh, that life is finite. Uh, it isn't enough just to say that and put that quality of despair into the voice and just hope it and, and just follow the rhythms. You've got to do many more things as well. You have to think and have analysed in rehearsal uh, totally so that your imagination uh, being fed by the concrete metaphors, concrete images, pictures, uh, can then feed through into the body, into gesture, into uh, timbre of voice, into eyelids, into every part of the actor's makeup. So that uh, it does seem, as I've just said, that uh, he is making it up as he goes along, although the actor, of course, knows that he isn't. But to start at the top with the first line, and I'll try as far as possible to relate this to blank verse, but it would be impossible for me not to mention uh, imagery and all sorts of other, all sorts of other uh, literary devices which we haven't been talking about generally today. Um, Satan says to uh, Macbeth, the Queen, my Lord, is dead. And Macbeth replies, she should have died hereafter, which is a short line. She should have died hereafter, indicating that there should be a pause, I think. And during that pause in performance, uh, with the audience uh, rather around me as you are now, I used to take that uh, advan uh, advantage of that pause uh, to catch the audience's eye uh, and begin the soliloquy, which is uh, Macbeth, me, the actor, to 
talking directly, sharing my thoughts with you, the audience. Uh, hereafter is, introduces one element of time, the future. Let me get a regular blank verse line. There would have been a time for such a word. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. There would have been a time, stressed, time, this speech is about time, for such a word. Word is the last line. Uh, what word? Uh, is it she, the queen? Is it hereafter? Is it time? There's something about that line which trips, in Hamlet's words, tick-tocks like a clock. There would have been a time for such a word. It's leading on to the next line, and here comes the word which is important, tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. There are only two words uh, in that uh, uh, line, an irregular line, given weight by re re uh, re its uh, re repetition three times. And the tripping of there would have been a time for such a word slows down on tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. The rhythm is important. It's also a non nonsense word if you say it three times or if you say it 20 times like a kid skipping tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. What does that word mean tomorrow? It's beginning to have the lack of meaning, I think, that uh, Macbeth, Macbeth detects in his own life at this point creeps in this petty pace from day to day. And here comes the first metaphor, the first image. And uh, the rhythm is beginning to creep, is beginning to plod, like someone plodding along, uh, plodding along a country lane. It's footsteps now, not the tick-tock of a clock. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day. Well, we've had tomorrow. We've now got today at the end of the line, from day to day, but it leads on to the next line, to, not day, but the last syllable of recorded time. And it slows up even more, ending up with a very important word, time, at the end of the sentence. Syllabell. I wonder if bell isn't the bell of a clock which records time. Let me get a regular line. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools. Yesterday. We've had tomorrow, we've had today, we've now got yesterday. We've got the whole complex of time. <laughs> Macbeth is not just talking about himself, he's talking about eternity and going to say something about it. All our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. And that's where the sentence ends, in the middle of the next line. But one has to carry on. Uh, and speak it as a line and a half. All our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. What is the image there that I must have clearly in my mind so that uh, I can get the right emotion of despair? It's what? It's a fool walking along a dusty path, plodding, creeping, with petty pace. A fool is what? A village idiot? Wandering along a country lane with what? A guttering candle? I don't know, a lantern? Uh, fool is a pun, of course. Uh, fools, uh, like Lear's fool, Feste, uh, in Twelfth Night, are professional entertainers. That will be relevant in a moment, and I have to contain in my mind, as I say the word fool, that it is a pun. See two sorts of fools. That a line is completed with the shock of the harsh rhythm of out, out, brief candle. The fool's candle has caught uh, a gust of wind and is blown out and he collapses into a dusty death in the unmade road of Elizabethan England. The last candle or light we saw in the play is uh, Lady Macbeth's candle uh, which she was carrying in her sleepwalking scene and she is dead. It's Lady Macbeth's death which is being talked about in the speech. It is the fool's death, village idiot's death. It's going to be Macbeth's death. It's going to be everybody's death. Uh, it's at this time, about this time, that Shakespeare wrote Macbeth that candles were being used in indoor theatres. Uh, and that may be relevant too when we get on to the next line, which is, Life's but a walking shadow. Walking gentleman is a phrase we still use in the theatre, meaning someone who is available in any company to walk on and play uh, a meagre part. He's the lowliest member of a company. But life is not even a walking gentleman, he's a walking shadow less than even the meanest player. And the line is completed uh, by a poor player. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And although 
Oh, Lord Macbeth is talking about time, about life. Shakespeare is bring, making that those vast, uh, uh, vast concepts very concrete, very particular, not just to Macbeth himself, but to the actor who is playing Macbeth, because we're now talking about players and the audience who know they are an audience, know that uh, McKellen playing Macbeth is an actor, they are beginning to be drawn into Macbeth's uh, dilemma as Macbeth relates it uh, to a player, to an actor. That's a regular line that struts and frets his art upon the stage and we're reminded perhaps of the King Cambyses and uh, Marlovian regular verse and people uh, who do stamp out the rhythm as they uh, parade. That struts and frets his hour, a concept of time, upon the stage and then is heard no more. End of sentence, end of thought, middle of the line however. It is a tale told by an idiot. Idiot um, reaches back into the fool who was walking along the country lane with a candle that went out. Full of sound and fury, end of line. And the last line is signifying nothing. And the beats of the rest of that pentameter are not there because the end of the speech is total silence, total oblivion, total emptiness. So much one could say about it, but just let me run through the last lines, of the last words of each line, and you'll see that they add up to what the speech is all about. Hereafter, word, tomorrow, today, time, fools, candle, player, stage, tale, fury, nothing. I must have all that in my mind as I'm going through it. Not so that you, the audience, can understand those complexities, because I'm not giving a lecture. I think the poetry and the rhythm and all those devices that Shakespeare uses are not for the audience's benefit, they are for the actors. So that having absorbed them into his heart and his mind, he can then express them with all the other things at his command, which are his body, his facial expression, and if the production is working well, the way the uh, production is blocked, is arranged, the way the scenery is painted, uh, and the way the lights are lit. Wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Days of lighted fools away to dusty death. Out. Out. Brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And then he's heard no more. Here's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. If you 
truly think through each word um, in the moment, then the audience are tricked into thinking that they've never heard it before. Because what the actor has to do is to convince himself he has right. never said it before. Yeah, but that, I think that's right. That is the trick. I mean, when you come to those speeches, the audience has to feel, wow, I'm hearing this for the first yes. time. And, that and now in the context of the whole play, not just, you know, yeah. taken out. Tomorrow and to tomorrow and tomorrow. Was well, I have to be right. honest about that. Yeah. I, I ran into <laughs> Sir Ian McKellen on the streets uh, just before we started rehearsals, he was actually doing his first run through of King Lear and he disappeared. They'd lost him and he'd gone, he'd gone to buy some sticky buns down the road and was one at the road. Eating them. And I said to him, hey, they're missing you. And he said, I'm in the middle of the storm. I said, oh, can you <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we got talking um, and he said, can I just give you a little, just one little mm -hmm. tip because he is a famous. The famous Macbeth, Macbeth, yeah. yeah. And I said, Any, anything at all. This was some weeks before we began. He said, tomorrow, 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 the important word is and. And it was like, oh, uh, you know, a, a flash idea. of comprehension. Yeah. And I said, I get it. Don't yeah. say it anymore. So Ian is entirely to be thanked for. Okay, so today we're very fortunate to have with us Ed Evans. Edward is a scholar of Shakespeare and once more Professor Kolbrenner, uh, a Shakespearean scholar in his own right, discussing a famous speech from the latter parts of the, the final act of Macbeth from Act 5, a very famous speech known for the line, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, a speech that dwells on the nature of time and its relationship to language. You've heard it performed in various versions already. You've heard one famous actor, Sir Ian McKellen, a Shakespearean dramatist, describing how he enacts this, how he performs this speech and what resonates for him in it. Let's talk about it on a scholarly level, a scholarly level. Ed, what is that word that the speaker that Macbeth, the title character, is referring to in the second line. There would have been a time for such a word. What do you think? In of the that? first instance, he's yeah. I think in the first instance, he's directly relating back to the messenger uh, reporting that his wife has died, reporting on her death. Actually, the word is death, um, and I think that the nature of her death is uh, literally untimely. Um, when, when she is going through her episode of madness, I recall that the doctor diagnoses her, tries to diagnose her, and he says uh, unnatural deeds to breed unnatural troubles, something along those lines. Um, and so I think what Macbeth is literal, her death is untimely. It is not when it should be. Dr. Feldman, can you, oh, we have the thing back on the screen, good. So, yeah. so I, I was gonna ask, I mean, your students probably know this already, and Ed was just addressing this. What is the antecedent of the word here? So Ed said it's just the word of the messenger. There would have mm -hmm. been times for such a word that is the, the message of her death. Yeah, is the character it? has just learned that his wife has died. I and see. the messenger says, the queen, my lord, is dead. And dead is death. I mean, I think uh, there's, there's, there is a local significance to this that yes, She's died an untimely and early death, as will Macbeth shortly hereafter at the very end of the play. But there is an element also of, and this is how Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's tragedies, but I think all classic literature reaches towards a, no, a notion that all of death is itself untimely. From the Iliad on, as our students have also read this in their first semester, that any death is to those suffering it or and to those closest to them, an untimely death. There is never a time to die. There is no, there is no, she should have died thereafter. Death is always what lies tomorrow or in some untold future. Professor Kolbrenner, please. No, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening. Um, and, and there's, and that's the, you know, that, that although this is, there's an untimely element to this particular death, 
death itself is a kind of an untimely phenomenon. I don't know if you want to respond to that, but it seems to also open up the abyss, abyss, the sort of groundless element of time that structures this particular speech. That time, um, so so I, I would I would, I, I would just add a couple of things. First of all, I think it's great that you're reading this because it not only shows the poetry of Shakespeare, but I think it's important. And even though you're not reading the whole play, scenes like these or speeches like this, and really every speech in Shakespeare becomes a lens through which to look at the whole play. And this this piece especially, it when you do get at some point to read Macbeth you'll see the way in which this speech, as Dr. Feldman just said, not only has a local meaning, not only in the plot, but a local meaning in the context of this scene, but it becomes a way really to understand the entire play. I would add just one other thing that, as Dr. Feldman says, Shakespeare is, is I wouldn't say he's obsessed by time, but time is the way he structures reality. And time is the way he structures different genres. Now, just to talk about comedy and tragedy, we already talked about this in 191. That tragedy, we know from the very beginning, and the Iliad is the origin of tragedy. It's the origin of the temporal structure that, 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 that structures tragedy, which is that time is a destroyer. And, and it ends in death. And we know that from the very beginning of the epic. We said uh, the Odyssey is a different genre and it becomes the origin for comedy. And by comedy, we don't mean ho, ho, ho comedy, but the comedy is we start at a beginning, we go through some kind of middle, which can be, be traumatic, like in the Odyssey, and then we come to the ending. So that's the comic version of time. And this is so clearly, coming back to Macbeth, so clearly we're really working against all of all of the energies of comedy of a life of an idea that life leads to affirmation or fruition or continuity all of that gets really obliterated here ed what what would what, what you want to uh, to to relate to what i just said i know i mean no we just talked about this a ton yeah yeah i mean the the way that um as you said it has its local context but it opens up uh, an interpretation of the play just to add to that i'd like to bring the idea that this is my Beth realizing what play he's in. And um, there is a lot of dissonance from the beginning of the play about uh, time. Um, I think most readers find it uncomfortable that the witches tell Macbeth that he's going to become king. And then they say Banquo, Banquo's heirs will then become uh, king. And Macbeth still goes ahead with the plot. Um, likewise, when the, when the, when the queen is preceding her suicide is, is imagining time. She also stands outside the time of the play. But what Macbeth is realizing here is that the structure of the, there's an inevitability to the structure of the play. So that his tragic flaw, the vaulting ambition, that he thinks he can get away with something outside time, time eventually calls him back into the structure of the play, which is why I think another interesting thing to talk about here is why we're talking not only about word and time but about performance actual theatrical performance and time wait, 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 wait one second i just want to ask you so is this like a greek tragedy really meaning you know you just said that macbeth realizes what kind of play he's in that is he realizes just like romeo and juliet in that play we know from the very beginning they're star-crossed lovers we know what their end is going to be so, and, and, and that, that seems like a very Greek model where there's no possibility of, and we just read Oedipus Rex, which is why I'm mentioning this, where there's no possibility of kind of getting out of the, the time scheme in which you're struck. That's Oedipus' story as well. The story's already been told. He can't get out of it. Is it similar here? I think it's um, entirely that. I mean, the way to put it within the Shakespearean context is to say that this is a response um, like most things, to Hamlet. So where Hamlet, at the beginning of his play, says the time is out of joint and tries to avoid playing his part, Macbeth has been actively playing a part set up for him for the beginning. He's not aware that he's playing. And it's only at this point, this is his, this is his recognition moment, his anagnorisis. It's very Greek. He suddenly realizes that he's played a part in his inescapable downfall and that his wife's death is part of that inescapability, that he's stuck in a play. And you, you, wait, 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 Ed, you, wait, you, 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 wait, wait, you use that Greek term anagnorisis. We never, we never discussed that, though we did, which is the Greek word for recognition. Self-recognition, um, recognition of self, ana, of 
gnosis of recognition and knowledge, but of that oh, most okay. profound kind of the, of the self. But go on, it's, Bill, you were asking. No, no, I'm, I'm just, well, isn't self, but isn't that self-knowledge often, sh I mean, is, 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 the, is the, the meeting between Odysseus and Penelope, is that anagnorisis as well? Isn't that recognition as well when they're recognizing each other? Yeah, I, I agree, but I think, as you said, it's, it, it depends on the genre. And I think the Shakespeare is playing here with the tragic genre by almost over asserting it in the sense that um, there are all these clues from the beginning that lead Macbeth to think that he can avoid the genre he's in. And even until the end, when he thinks Burnham Wood, it's impossible that Burnham Wood is going to rise from the soil. And it's impossible that um, that Macduff, um, who is, uh, must have been born of a woman, could possibly um, threaten his... He gets all these clues that somehow he can avoid his own fate um, within the play. Can we go, can we, can we just nothing, go, I mean, I I, I, can we, sorry to interrupt you, Ed, but can we just go back to the text? Because I know no the problem. students have seen this 19 times, but I wouldn't mind reading it. And Dr. Feldman has, has vanished. So it's just you and me, Ed. We're going to take, we're taking over here. Um, so it says right. tomorrow, you're still here. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. There is that emphasis on language, which we really haven't addressed entirely yet. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. And yesterdays are not transformative. The past is not transformative. It just leads to death. And here he says, out, out, brief candle. I guess, what is that even, what is he even saying that? Is that part, what is he saying there? Dr. Feldman, out, out, brief well, candle. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, the, the, I just want to, what we, we should, I'll, I will address that. And I want to also hear your responses to that, those particular lines. To respond to, just to add to what the, that insightful conversation or back, uh, back and forth you two just had, I think there is certainly a parallel that one that I never considered before between the anagnorisis, the recognition scene at the er comedy of the odyssey between Odysseus and Penelope, who are two versions of the same person. They are uniquely suited since they are pretty much the same character, as well as between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth here. Also, a devilish pair made for each other. This, pat, this speech begins speaking that she should have died, recognizing that she is dead. This woman that he, of, of, who has driven the speaker here, Macbeth, to everything that he has done. And then it pivots in the middle with that, with that line of out, out, brief candle. He's speaking still about her, but then after that, he seems to be speaking about himself. The recognition of her demise, of his wife's demise, of Lady Macbeth's death, brings him to consider his own impending death to the point where I think Ed described this, and I just want to spell this out for us all, that when he then says, after out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, that he is recognizing himself in his play as he is that poor player. From what Ed was saying, I, I take it to mean that you read it as he is, he is now realizing how he has been manipulated. He and his wife, who thought they were pulling the strings of everyone else, are just poor puppets. They, the, he himself is just a poor player, and he has had as you correctly say, he has had his hour or his two hours upon the stage over the course of this play and will be, no, and will be heard no more hereafter in just a few more minutes. That this is not just a tale, not just a story, not just a series of n narrative events born by time, as, we, as Professor Colbert was saying before, but it is a story created by language. It is a play. It's not just a story, but it's a story created of words. And he's talking about himself, he's talking about his wife, but then talking about himself and blending some resonance to what he sees as kind of a human condition here. But we can, uh, we, let's return now to, the, to just those candles. The candle, of course, is a metaphor for, for life, for those poor players, is it not? Right, just before Ed responds to that, because I, I want to hear what he has to say, but, but um, I, I think it's just important even though we're not doing Macbeth as a play, but to think about tragedy. And in tragedy, play has, it's not transformative at all. In Shakespearean comedy, play 
language, art, the stage is transformative. It can change who you are. And here, the, the, the play just leads to death. It's right? brief, it's evanescent, it's you know, fleeting, yeah. and it, it signifies nothing. Nothing has changed. Is that, is that, is that an embrace here of that? Ed, is that an embrace here signifying nothing, that nihilism, an embrace of Aristotelian dramatics of tragedy? That nothing really is, he's gone on his, he's been on the stage, he's had his moment, he said his piece, but nothing really has changed for him. I, I think he, um, this, this is frustrating because whatever Ed is saying is in, very interesting. Yeah, he, uh, we really I, want to hear it. Let's just wait a second. So, uh, his wait, internet will be restored. We just couldn't hear you, Ed. We want, you know, we the, thank God a brilliant in, reader in, of, in, of Shakespeare here. More than he does in any other form or way. Ah. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Just start again. I think it's. I think you've come back. Just start that whole comment again, please. Oh dear. Again. Uh, yes. To add. Earth to add. Let me just try and do something. Yes, I'm going to try and correct this. Um, Bill, do you have any, uh, Professor Kohlbrenner? Do you have anything to say about the, you know, there, there are several, um, about just the metaphors, which, I, which we'll get to also, but the candle, the poor player, the idiot, um, that these are what, these are what the, the characters have become, what the humans have become. You know that famous speech from As You Like It, All the World's a Stage? And everybody talks about, well, I mean, that's always quoted out of context in some kind mm -hmm. of celebratory way, but it's given by the most depressing character in the play. He's referred to as Monsieur Melancholy. And really what he's saying is essentially what Macbeth is acting out here. All the world's a, a, a stage and every man has a certain number of acts and you just go through those acts and then you die. Yeah. And, 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 there, and to pair these two very famous comments in what is one of the one of the darkest tragedies, and then there, and as you like it, in one of the um, most jolly comedies, is certainly very significant. These, um, you know, these, this is Shakespeare throwing back the curtain on his own dramatic, uh, on his own, on his his own, uh, you know, like breaking the fourth wall, saying this is just this is just uh, a stage, but the stage the stage extends into the pit and into the, the area of the audience, into the world itself. And that's how it's happening in both plays. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason As You Like It is not just a jolly play as it's often dismissed, is because it gets so close to death, is that it accommodates the world of tragedy even as it overcomes it. I said before that tragedy, that comedy moves through a possible trauma to its, back to its beginning, to an, to an end which is a new beginning. And as you like it, it's such a great play. And it's just good to think about the way in which great writers, especially Shakespeare, is always thinking about genre. And he's kind of bringing these two visions together. One is, and as you like it, one is the comic affirmation at the end. Everybody gets ma married, but there's still this kind of very tragic vision. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Ed, Ed would, Ed's writing about this, the way in which this kind of tragic vision just gains more and more traction in Shakespeare's plays. Right. So let's go things back powerful. to you, to uh, Mr. Evans. Yeah, to go. To, sorry, sorry about that. To go, to go back to, um, and and it it relates to as you like it, um, because in, in that play, I think you know, Jaques or Jakes is, is trapped in the wrong play. But uh, but to, to to go back to what's happening here, I think Macbeth is unaware that he is overplaying his role within the genre. I think in most other Shakespearean tragedies, and I was saying that um, at the end of Antony and Cleopatra, Cleopatra clearly tries to perform her way out of tragedy. Hamlet, from the beginning of his play, tries to perform his way out of tragedy. In the end, they're all um, fated, as Macbeth shows us here, to the inevitable doom that tragedy um, has uh, ingrained into it. But the difference between their performances within tragedy and Macbeth's is that I think, uh, and, and, and we'll go back to the relationship with Lady Macbeth, because I thought that was very interesting, is that actually Macbeth completely commits to the genre 
but is completely unaware that he is doing so until this speech. I think in relation to Lady Macbeth, I think that's fantastic, the idea they mirror each other. Um, and, and I think they mirror each other in the sense that also she is a, she, she, she convinces Macbeth to go along. I mean, he does have some reservations. He, at the beginning, isn't quite sure he wants to play his part in this tragedy. And she convinces him to. Um, and so the fact that her death becomes before his becomes a clear signal, I think, of what is going to happen to him shortly. And, and just to go to the beginning, when Lady Macbeth tells or convinces, convinces Macbeth to, uh, to, to murder um, the king, uh, she says uh, to him, to beguile the time, look like the time. And uh, what she is trying to, she's convincing Macbeth that, you know, you can stand outside the time of the tragic genre. And it's only after her madness and her death that he suddenly realizes she was wrong. Um, and, and that their fate, their connected fates, will lead inevitably to that dusty death. Um, That's a brilliant association to recall that other line, how it prefigures this speech. And in order to have a full appreciation, we're, you know, we're, with our 194 students in poetry, we're focusing on this piece as a standalone bit of poetry that we've tried to, for which we've tried to fill in some of the context of its dramatic, uh, its dramatic and tragic uh, can I ask you one more? Can I ask you one more question? It sounds like you're concluding. Um, are these are these genres? I mean, this is a structure of time. I'm just wondering to what extent are, are do do we still have structures of time? Comic, tragic. Do, I mean, you talked about breaking the fourth wall. Does it come into our existences? These conceptions of of time as possibly redemptive and as tragic. Doctor Feldman. We are. We are reading this this speech in the, in a sequence of other uh, poems from various movements and eras that also dwell on time, and uh, we've gone through experiences in recent years, recent months, that certainly warp our sense of time. We always think, and we always think that we are at the end of time, that any time that any given moment in which we're reading, we look back on the entire past and say it was leading to now. But a speech like this and the points that, that you two have brought up remind us that the great writers are in a continuum of, and the great thinkers are in a continuum of how humans have always had that experience, people hundreds of years ago, um, and requires perhaps greater effort in our time to take a step back and to think about the hereafter, think about our all of our, all the yesterdays and where we might be leading. Um, I'm not quite yet at the finish. There's still one more bit I want to get through, but I'll give Ed, Ed a chance to respond as well since very thoughtful, thoughtful reader of Shakespeare. Please, Ed. Uh, yeah, I, I, I find what, you, what you've called the nihilism of this passage interesting because I think coming as we all do after Shakespeare, we sort of take it for granted, um, certainly in the context of his time, most of his audience would have believed, um, at least culturally, in the concept of an afterlife. And, and here, there is no afterlife at all. Once the curtain comes down, um, Macbeth is uh, saying it's all over and it has signified nothing. Um, in, in Shakespeare's later plays, of course, um, which is an interesting way to think of this nihilism, time is stretched in almost preposterous ways. Um, in order to suggest the possibility of redemption through playing and then into an afterlife. Uh, so this, this, this tragic concept of time is extremely, I mean, it ends extremely abruptly. And I think it's a peculiarity rather than in Shakespeare's plays rather than um, necessarily a standard uh, way that he reads time. Wow, Shakespeare seems really interesting. <laughs> and thankfully, we'll have our, all of our students will have opportunity to to delve into it more. The point I wanted to end on was to come back to the petty pace, the tomorrow and tomorrow, the dusty death, the struts and frets, how the language of this speech, its prosody, its poetics, are also make also contribute to. They are the constitutive constituent elements 
of these larger themes that we've been describing. And the capable performer and close reader of Shakespeare's poetry can tease this out, that there would have been a time for such a word, the staccato nature of it, the tomorrow, tomorrow, and the creeps in this petty pace, the dusty death, those hard syllabants of the alliteration, the brief words, the, um, the, the, the clipped rhymes, have a kind of parallel in that tick-tock nature of time that is set off against another sound in this speech, the long sounds of tomorrow and more and signifying nothing. And the place where I see this most clearly, or I hear it most clearly contrasted, and this was what Ian McKellen was saying, where he focuses his energies when performing this speech, is how the dusty death, which brings you to a complete stop, is then contrasted with out, which has a bit of the hard sound, the T, the consonants, that's what we would call it, the T's of the out, out, brief candle. In the same words, contrast with the out, the long vowel sounds of the out. And the poor player, the pu -pu, the C, the P, it is of that alliteration of poor player, have it again in the same word, poor player. Not sure if he's in this elongated span of time or this short moment. When McKellen performs this, the tale told, there you have it in an enjammed over the course of the line break, the same alliteration, the tale told by an idiot. And there again in the idiot, you hear the out, idiot, the, st the strong alliteration, but elongated by the idiot. And he's wondering, am I that idiot? Perhaps identifying with that full of sound and fury, slowing himself down. McKellen performs signifying, as all good performers do, not quite sure what he's going to say next. Perhaps he has one last, Macbeth does, has one last illusion of what all this has meant. And then nothing. It comes as a surprise to Macbeth when McKellen, in M M McKellen's Macbeth, this performer's Macbeth, signifying, and he's not sure he wants to say, nothing. That long sound sort of trailing off into nothingness. Language too is, exists in the, as we call it, the diachronic. Language too is something that is structured by time, not just events, not just our lives, but language has to follow one, one sound, one syllable, as it says, the last syllable, one syllable to the next, it creeps along. And the pace of language can both speed up at times, it can slow, but it always has this property of opening up into nothingness or to eternity, or as, as Ed was saying, into immortality, the hereafter. And this is language that has all of that, those different rhythms compressed into it. I'll give you guys the final words. That's my final word. Um, Ed, Professor Kohlbrenner, please, you've been very generous with your, with your time already. Last thoughts about this before we sign off. Do you, do you always depress your students like this, Daniel? They mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, it's all yours. <laughs> I love that um, McKellen, um, that surprise on the word nothing. I thought, I think that's a fantastic interpretation. Just to add one final thing on the language, um, the alliteration here seems to uh, be quite uh, obviously foregrounded with the petty pace, the dusty death, the poor player. And I think that also um, evokes something to do with the, the tick-tocking of, of time. It, it creates a sort of inevitability to the next word in the sentence, or at least the opening sound of the next word in the sentence. And you, you feel time marching along through the speech. Very nice. Bill, is there a way to not, to Professor Colburn, is there a way to leave this on a, it's, it is a tragic end, and, uh, and it's the end of a, of course, Macbeth, we're not really rooting for him. He is a tragic figure, although there's always that identification with the villain of any of these plays. How can we leave this in a slightly more uplifting or upbeat lesson? I think the lesson is the, is the analysis, is the insights that one gains from poetry, from the richness of bringing our understanding of the Odyssey and of the Iliad into Shakespeare, our understanding of poetics and poetry analysis into the great works of Shakespeare, into language itself, how these syllables and recorded time, leaving time for enough of these words that, that, we, that we still have 
that's that's where I draw inspiration. What would you what would you say, Professor Colburn, in closing? I think feel the same way. Just the process of reading. Mm -hmm. And here, the the character the character has almost finally read himself. He finally has read what play he's in. He's found his place. I think that is uh, very right to to draw our attention to that. Good. Well, thank you so much, you two. This is very thank very you, generous Dr. of you. Thank and you I'm sure we're, uh... Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. 